<laughs> so tonight I'm going to take you from a review to the total eradication of, of sin. <laughs> and the total eradication of sin happens just before the new heaven and the new earth. So I'm going to give a bit of a review and then we're going to end up there. I'm going to, I'm going to highlight a couple of problem terminologies for people. You know, the re let me just tell you, the reason I started doing this is because I was just so concerned about how um, off folks are uh, in their teaching of biblical prophecy and end time prophecy. And, and of course, you know, with every generation and the unique things go on in generation. Now, you know, Bible prophets supposedly rise up and say, now the Antichrist is Obama and uh, and the, now the, uh, uh, the, anti uh, the, the Antichrist is uh, ISIS and, you know, and it just goes on and on. It just never stops, never stops. And we want people not to be tossed to and fro. We want people to understand the solidity, the actual facts and truth of the Word of God and just be stable there. And the Lord's made it, you know, made us able to be able uh, to, 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 to have that kind of insight through His Word. So... You know, one of the things that really got me, I mean, this really provoked me, is I heard a guy who's, you know, just all of a sudden he's raised, he's, he's, he's risen to fame, and he says we're, you know, like in the fourth trumpet. <laughs> and I'm thinking, who is even listening to him? And then come to find out, you know, he's like got this huge ministry, he's got all this support, and it's not just him. Now all of a sudden I see him associated with all these other high-profile ministries, and I'm just... You know, for lack of a better word, I'm flabbergasted. I'm just, I'm just, I, I, I'm confounded. I, and so it really motivated me. Get prophecy out. Make sure that everybody around you understands that we're not in the fourth trumpet judgment of the ninth chapter of the book of Revelation. And I can quantitate that for you. And I did that the first couple of times. And so if you open up your Bible, and I hope you quantitate it in case somebody says, you know, <clears throat> are we already in the tribulation? You can say, Absolutely not. And, and let me tell you why. Let me just give you, I'm going to give you real quickly, and it's a, a matter of you, I'm going to give you real quickly 12 very solid points, quantitative points of why we're not in the tribulation right now. Revelation, as funny as that sounds, <laughs> Revelation 6, 12, and I beheld when he had opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the men became as blood. That didn't happen, number one. Number two, and the stars of heaven fell unto the earth, even as a fig tree cast her untimely figs when she is shaken of a mighty wind. That didn't happen. And anybody see that happen? I'm telling you, everybody didn't know about it. I mean, guarantee you. <laughs> and 14, I mean, number three, verse 14. And the heaven departed as a scroll, and as it rolled together, and every mountain and island was moved out of their places. Has not happened quantitatively. Somebody said, I don't know, it's spiritual. You do not have the right, nor the capacity, nor the proofs, nor the evidence nor the in anything else to say that it's it's spiritual and then you're going to tell us what it means you're not god i want the word of god we're sticking with the word of god this is what we got to this is what we got to all agree to so there's three and four right there heavens haven't departed like a scroll and every mountain island hadn't been moved out of their place they still exactly where they were i know japan got moved just a little bit they said it got moved just a little bit from that great earthquake what we're saying every didn't just say japan got moved a little bit so uh, verse 15 <laughs> and the kings of the earth and the great men and the rich men and the chief captains and the mighty men and every bond man and every free man is that everybody <laughs> okay <laughs> hid themselves in the dens of the rocks of the mountains has not happened it has not happened, okay? We're not even out of chapter 6 yet, much less in chapter 9. I want to make sure that everybody understands exactly why I'm doing this. I want you to recognize that this walk with God is quantitative. The things that he's going to do that he's done and that he's going to do is quantitative. It's measurable. You can have insight to know what's up. All you got to do is uh, just simply listen up. Now, let's... Just jump over real quickly and um, to chapter eight and and look in verse seven, and now the first angels we, we're we're now into the 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 first trumpet. The first angel sounded and there followed um, hell, uh, fire mingled with blood, 
And uh, I haven't heard that on the weather report lately. <laughs> <laughs> and <laughs> they were cast upon the earth and a third part of the trees burn up. Has never happened in the history, known history of men. A third part of the trees and all green grass. Has not happened, sir. Has not happened. Um, there's a big, and you're going to hear more of it. I'm telling you, you're going to hear more of it because of the deception. Oh, Chernobyl. Did you know that that was actually wormwood? That was the star wormwood fell out of the sky. And is well, it's, that, that's, goodness gracious. I don't even know how people can keep a straight face and say something like that. Okay, so, <laughs> I just even feel any, feel good about themselves after that in any way. But at any rate, that's seven and eight. That's seven and eight. Fire mingled with blood, and as a result, the fire mingled with blood burns up a third of the tree, all green grass. That's, so that's seven and eight. That hadn't happened. Okay. Unless, okay. Oh. And the second angel sounded, and, and there was a great mountain, and, a, and, there were, were, and there was, as it were, a great mountain burning with fire, cast into the sea, and a third part of the sea became blood. Hasn't happened. Can't spiritualize it. It is what it is. And a third part of the creatures which were in the sea, this is very definite, that had life, died. And a third part of the ships were destroyed. It's never happened. Okay. We're, you're not having to take my word for this. <laughs> it's not my word against somebody else's word. It's simply the evidence of what God has to say, and everybody needs to be quiet after Father has spoken. Job was. Verse 10, And the third angel sounded, and there fell a great star from heaven, burning as it were a lamp, and it fell upon a third part of the rivers and upon the fountains of waters. Okay, so, uh, so here, here it is. And the name of the star was called Wormwood. Now here's what people are doing. They're spiritualizing everything. And, and, and see how very definite that is? It fell from heaven. It fell upon the rivers. And it fell upon the fountains of water. So that's the springs underneath the, the earth. And now they're spiritualizing it. And they're saying, well, that was Chernobyl. And, 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 and then, you know, unfortunately, what's really silly about that and what's really ignorant is that there's no way that Chernobyl had that dimension of an impact, even if, it, even if you were going to make a nuclear power plant. It didn't fall from heaven. Russia's not heaven. It, it's, you know, how do you, how do you set up all of the dynamics to make that interpretation? And, uh, oh, well, you know, it's worse than it was because everybody's got a conspiracy going on. Okay, hogwash, forget about it. Verse 12. And, and the fourth angel sounded, and a third part of the sun was smitten, and a third part of the moon, and a third part of the stars, and a third part of them was darkened, and the day shone not for a third part of it, and the night likewise. So we got one-third of all of the heavenly celestial lights are not shining, and, it's a, and, it's, and it's, they're not shining for one-third of the day, and one third of the night, so it's one third of the day is dark, and one third of the night is absolutely black dark. I mean, you never, that is black dark. And so that's not happened. And then as we keep going here, where the, for the folks that believe we're now already in the second part, we're in like in the fourth year, if I was to take us there, none of us even would be sitting. You would not be watching on a computer right now. Because the earth is completely devastated. There's hardly anything left. There's no mountains even existing anymore. Things have been brought down. There's been such massive cataclysmic events and earthquakes that the earth's geography is, the topo topography is completely different. So that's, please don't do that. Don't do that with the word of God because you're setting yourself up for deception. And then furthermore, the Lord emphasizing, he said, don't you add to this book because if you add to this book, then the plagues will be added to you. And listen, uh, folks that are, that are just feeling like you can get you know, these wild ideas to write another book. He said, is it worth having your name taken out of the book of life? He said, if you take away from this, your name should be taken out of the book of life. Don't do that. And I'm going to say to you, don't do that. Leave it saying exactly what it says. Okay, because I guarantee you it's going to turn out just that way. Look at all the rest of the prophecy and look at how it turned out. We've got a very clear, God's got a great track record of being accurate. Okay, so we're just going to leave him 
to the accuracy that he has. Now, there's something that as far as far as the other important point of review that I wanted to give to you tonight is helping you to understand where the Antichrist comes from. And one of the big stumbling blocks is people said, oh, uh, Ezekiel 38 and Ezekiel 39, he comes out of Gog and Magog. Well, there is no coming out of Gog. Gog is a person, okay? Read 38 and 39 again. <laughs> Magog is where he comes from, supposedly. And if you really try to really push that, then you would have to say, well, that's somewhere around in, in Turkey. Magog is somewhere in Turkey, but it didn't, it wasn't sensational back in the days when, you know, Russia was our enemy and overthrow us and we're all hiding under desks practicing for a nuclear explosion. And no, we did that. We had to do that. We were like in elementary school, okay, everybody, the alarm goes off, get underneath the desk, a nuclear explosion. Okay. <laughs> Russia is attacking us. Oh, it's perfect now. Yeah, Gog and Magog. Well, Gog is the person, and, he, and Gog and Magog over and again, where there is, an, even in Ezekiel 38 and 39, talks of a great uh, uh, armies of people that come from the uttermost parts of the earth. It's a collection of all nations. And then when you get Gog and Magog over into Revelation chapter 20, verse 8, it's clearly Gog is Satan. And Magog is all the nations, all the peoples that he could gather together. It's that way in Ezekiel 38, 39. Go read it again, okay? And I, I, I dare, I, I challenge anyone that's listening to me. You get any credible theologian, any credible academician of the Bible, and you get them to tell you that Gog is a nation. They're not going to do it. And you get them to tell you that Gog is an actual identifiable person, and they're going to tell you it cannot be done. And, 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 and then ultimately, if you're going to try to pin it down to a geographical location, it all flies uh, to pieces by Revelation chapter 8. But keep it with the text. The Lord's talking about this this powerful person who's identified with the name of Gog that is able to gather together all of the armies of the earth and bring them for a purpose of camping or rather fighting against God himself. And you know, I, I, you know, I think that one of the things that the Lord has recently enriched me with is just helping me to understand why he has allowed sin to continue on. Because as a witness to all creation, Father is showing that sin has its ultimate conclusion in hating everything that life is about. And that ultimate conclusion is seen in the battle of Armageddon where men come together for the sole purpose of killing God, of destroying him, of breaking off his rule and his influence. Look, that is what the least little bit of sin will ultimately have as its full conclusion. And that's why the Lord says the grapes are are fully ripe right now. He's saying sin is fully ripe. It started like a little seemingly unimposing, harmless little plan. But look at the look at its full ripe state. Men want to not just not serve God. They want to destroy him, kill him, eliminate him. And he stands for everything of life and everything of love and everything is goodness. And so ultimately that's where everything is going. And of course, I'm going to leave. You know, I'll, just, I'll state this and I'll come back to it. You know, ultimately, Satan is going to be loose for a little season after he's bound for a thousand years. We'll go get into this a little, just a little bit tonight. But then he comes up as Gog. He is Gog. He's, <laughs> Revelation 20, verse 8. That's Satan. He's loose for a little season and he's Gog. And he goes and he gathers together out of the uttermost parts of the earth. Every single person who is tired of living uh, under the rule of God. Can you imagine that? Lived under the rule of God and they're just looking for an opportunity to go and have a place to commit sin. God will always give people a region, a realm, a place to go and do whatever it is that they want to do so it can all be sorted out because God's going to sort it out. It's a sad thing to think that people would rather live in hate than love. You want to believe things better, folks. But it's true. People would rather live in war than live in peace. You know, it's, people would rather be evil than to walk in the goodness of God. But it, it's just true. You know, it's a sad state that men sit in darkness and under the shadow of death. 
But praise God, all of a sudden the light sprang up and everybody say, so you think that the whole world, whole earth would break out in the hallelujah chorus? But they don't. Men hate dark, men hate light. They love darkness rather than light because they want to continue on in evil. They don't want to get right. Huh? The right, God sets for us his judgments and his ways his, so that he may, he, he declares his ways so that it may be a dividing line for those who want to learn and walk in righteousness and those who continually want to hold on in iniquity. So ultimately, when God expresses his ways and makes himself known, the wicked fall therein. But the righteous, they go on, they begin to shine more and more. And they shine the brightness of his own goodness and glory. So what I want to do now is I want to help you to better, to better identify where the Antichrist comes from and, and who he is. And, you know, last time we got together, so the last, uh, you, the, the YouTube just before this one, I can't remember what YouTube this one is, but the YouTube just before this one, um, what YouTube is this one? Does anybody know? 14. So the YouTube just before this one was, is going to ultimately spend a little time talking about Nimrod because you've really got to look at Nimrod's kingdom. Uh, Nimrod was a hunter of men. He enslaved the world. He wanted to bring all the world together. He had an agenda. He wanted, he wanted to overthrow God. It's really what he wanted to do. The Satan is constantly just re, you know, re-attempting to do that which he's tried to do at the very onset, and that is to overthrow God. And we see him uh, continually making an effort. Armageddon is one of his last big efforts, and then then there's the final effort that we're going to also look at tonight, which is at the very end of the thousand-year reign. But Nimrod wanted to do that, and he gathered all men together in an attempt to do that. And he really marks for us a personification of, an anti, of the type of Antichrist. And it all began there, and it's all going to end there. And that's why he's the one who, dis, he's the one who, dis, um, who created Babylon. He is the one who you know, was going to say discovered it. No, he created it. Okay? He established Babylon. And you could see that all of God's interest is focused on Babylon when it comes to all that the Antichrist is going to be doing and all of the evil that he will propagate in that last seven years. So the, the uh, understanding uh, effectively the whore riding the beast in Revelation chapter 17, you must go back to Nimrod and you must look at what took place there and had a continual sequence and succession of events that even lead up into the modern times from Nimrod and will find its full expression in the Antichrist. It found a lot of expression on Nimrod's kingdom and what Nimrod did found a lot of expression in Egypt. And it found a lot of expression in Assyria under Sennacherib. And it found a lot of expression in Nebuchadnezzar in the kingdom of Babylon. And it found a lot of expression in the Xerxes of the Medes and the Persians. And it found a lot of expression in Alexander the Great in the Grecian Empire. And it found a lot of expression among the Caesars of the Roman Empire. And people don't realize that there's a connectivity of the Roman Empire even into this very day. There's a connectivity. Uh -huh. And there's going to be even something more that's going to emerge out of that in the, in the, in the, in the not-too-distant future. And that's a lot about the symbolism and that also, remember, Daniel not only gives symbolisms, but he interprets the symbols. He doesn't leave it up for us to all just figure out, my goodness, what's that? And so I, 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 I like to, when, I, when I'm giving people the ability or trying to help people have the ability to understand this from their own personal study. I like to help you not only to look at charts as we did last time, but just open up the Bible and allow you to see this. And um, so I want you to open up with me to Daniel chapter seven. Let me just get my little iPad out here because I get, have adjusted fonts of my own making. So open up to Daniel chapter seven and, and just kind of, kind of, I'm just going to kind of show you how this, how this goes. Um, let's see here. Let's see if this thing opens up for me. Here we go. Here we go. Okay, Daniel chapter 7. What I want you to see here in Daniel chapter 7 
is I want you to first be able to identify the Antichrist. And what, what Daniel does is he gives us like a 30,000 foot view of where he's coming from. And then he begins to zero in on it where he, where he comes from. So that we can lock down the actual nations. And then as you, I've told you over and again, in the conclusion, you find him right there coming out of Assyrian, a, a, out of Assyria as the Assyrian. Over and again, you'll see the Antichrist equated to the Assyrian as the prophets prophesy. And so I, I want you to see how Daniel helps us to just focus right down in on him and be able to, to understand him from the perspective as, uh, as, as the little horn. And so um, open your Bibles, Daniel chapter 7, verse 7. Okay, this is where you begin. After this I saw in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast. And I'm going to backtrack in a minute and tell you about the fourth beast so that we can really lock that in for you here as well. But one thing that you're going to notice about the fourth beast as they talk about him is he's going to be a, this fourth beast. There's a, something about this fourth beast that exists when the kingdom of God uh, comes to earth in, in a literal sense as Christ Jesus comes to destroy uh, the Antichrist and set up God's eternal kingdom and establish his throne right here among us. So in, it, it describes the fourth beast as dreadful and terrible, strong and, exceed, strong, and strong exceedingly. And it, <clears throat> and it had great iron teeth. It devoured breaking pieces and stamped the residue with its feet of it. And it was diverse from the, all the other beasts that was before it. And it had ten horns. And I considered the horns, and behold, there came up among them another little horn. Now, the little horn is very important for you because every time you see the little horn, the little horn is the one who ultimately uh, is the, 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 the Antichrist, the one who uh, commits the abomination that makes the temple of God desolate, which is a very important peg in the ground because that says that's the middle of the tribulation. That's the middle of the book of Revelation. That gets you in Revelation chapter 12 and Revelation chapter 13. It helps us to understand it's the middle of the 70th week of Daniel's vision, which, you know, we've also got a YouTube for that. We've gone over Daniel's seven, 70 weeks of vision, uh, 70 weeks that God gave him, showing him, um, forgive me, yes, showing him the entire events that would take place until the kingdom of God is set up here on the earth. And 69 weeks of that 70-week duration has been completed. 69th week was completed with the death of the Lord Jesus Christ at Calvary. We've been now about 2,000 years waiting for the start of the 70th week. <clears throat> what starts the 70th week? What starts the 70th week is the first uh, year uh, of the seven-year tribulation. Are you with me? Understand? S each day being a year within the progression of this, this prophecy. And so I'm, I'm, hoping that you, I'm hoping that these things are really familiar to you, um, that you're getting them. And so I said, well, why must there be a, such a long duration between the 69th week and the 70th week? Because the church is occupying the space and time right now. This is the age and, and, and administration of the goodness and the grace of God that's bringing in uh, this wonderful harvest unto the Lord Jesus, his Father makes known his goodness to all the nations of the earth, including all men everywhere. That's why. But then the Lord ultimately is going to close the door on it, and he's going to turn back to dealing with his, the people and the nation of Israel, the children of Abraham, according as Daniel prophesied, his 70 weeks was about the children of Abraham and the nation of Israel, and that's on hold right now. Okay? Very important point for you. Very important point. So, I considered the horns. Behold, there came up among them a little horn before whom there were three. Okay? Before whom there were three of the first horns plucked up by the roots. So, and behold, in the horn, in the little horn, there was eyes like the eyes of a man and a mouth speaking great things. It's one thing about this little horn, he's always got a mouth on him. And his mouth is speaking boisterous things against God. And 
His mouth is speaking boisterous things against God because he's saying he is God. And he wants to be worshipped as God. And that's how he ultimately um, uh, commits the abomination that makes the temple desolate because he goes into the temple in Israel, into the holies of holies, declares himself God. Now, what did Jesus say about that? Jesus gave us a time point. See, all the prophets gave us that time point, especially Daniel. Now, Jesus gives us that time point, makes that time point very clear. And he says, when this happens, he said, now the worst things that have ever taken place on the face of the earth is going to take place. He that is in the field, don't turn back to your house and flee to the mountains. Are you with me? So it's a very important uh, time point that helps us understand how to break various different dimensions of how God's dealing with men out. It's a peg in the ground that helps us to understand how to navigate uh, from where we're at right now to that point in the future. Um, I beheld, and here's what we see now, it, concerning this fourth beast, remember, important, I beheld, verse 9, till the thrones were cast down, and the Ancient of Days did sit, whose garment was white as snow, and his hair of his head like the pure wool of and his throne like the fire flame and the wheels that burning and the wheels as, as burning fire. Speaking of in similar respects to how Ezekiel saw um, the Lord upon his, he, Ezekiel saw the Lord on his mobile throne held up by the cherubims. Huh? And it was like a sea of, of crystal that he set upon as it were. A throne of sapphire, because there's just no other way to describe it. Just all various different dimensions of his, of his goodness and of his glory. But to help you just understand this just a little bit more, um, I want to go back to uh, Daniel chapter 2 real quickly so that I can then help you understand for certain who this fourth kingdom is and how that this fourth kingdom can, as it were, be around and I'm going to show you that it's just kind of around, kind of sort of around when Jesus comes. So go back with me quickly to Daniel chapter 2. Somebody got the Bible open? Yes. Oh, I'll just, I'll just go back with this little silly thing. As long as the computer, sometimes it basically goes, it, it goes wacky. It says, oh, you're having to make me think too much, so I'm just going to quit. I'm going to sleep now. <laughs> Okay, well, this is why I decided never to preach with uh, um, an iPad. <laughs> of course, you know, when the computers first started coming out, this is the Antichrist, remember? <laughs> so here we go. And I got, another, I got another symbol of the Antichrist, a special for tonight. And this is, this is the up and coming mark of the beast. I got two marks of the beast in my back pocket here. This is the up and coming mark of the beast. And this is the one we thought it was, but it didn't work out. <laughs> and of course, none of them are. Okay. And it's somebody said, what are you going to do? They're going to put credit card chip underneath your skin. First of all, I don't want a credit card chip underneath my skin. <laughs> but second of all, the mark of the beast isn't going to work that way. It's going to be a part of you knowing you are bowing down to worship Satan. Okay, it is a it is a satanic occult. It is a satan. It's a Luciferian cult, a satanic occult that goes to another level beyond anything that has ever happened in all the history of men. So I just want you to be able to first and foremost understand something about the image that um, King Nebuchadnezzar first dreamed of. Where is he at? Babylon. Where is it all going to end? Babylon. What did I talk to you about last time? Mystery Babylon, Revelation chapter 17. What also? R literal Babylon, chapter, uh, Revelation chapter 18. Babylon is the central focus. Then why is it we're going to make it New York? Why is it that we're going to make it <laughs> the Vatican at Rome? Why is it that we now, you know, want to make it 
you know, Russia. Well, you don't want, most people are, are, are yawning over that now. They're finally convinced, no, it ain't Russia. Well, you know, it could be, you know. Oh, they had, you don't understand, man. Uh, Mussolini, Hitler was definitely the Antichrist. Mussolini was definitely the Antichrist. Stalin was definitely the Antichrist. There have been so many definite Antichrists. And you'd think that God's people would quit being so gullible. No, we're just as gullible as we've ever been. And it's, uh, somehow we're going to have to just sober up you know, and understand, wait a minute, come on, let's just listen to what Father has to say. Man's got to be wrong every time. God's going to be right every time. Man's got to be wrong every time. It's not like man's going to be wrong, you know, uh, you know, just 99% of the time. We're waiting around for the 1% to happen, and it possibly could be now. No, man's going to be wrong 100% of the time. Okay. Now, so the most important thing to make the connection here with the little horn is to recognize that when you look at this image and you get to the feet, the ten toes, that's when the kingdom of God sets up. Because, you know, you saw in the vision, as it were, a, a stone or a rock cut out without hands. It cast, was cast out of heaven. It smote the image, which represents all the kingdoms of men, right? All the great empires of men. It struck the kingdoms of men, that image, in the feet. And it was there, it was there that the rock ultimately is in interfacing Christ Jesus is interfacing with a government of man it's at that it's at that last day and then that rock ultimately after after it strikes the feet that's where the war takes place that's where the battle the confrontation is what happens then the whole image now crumbles becomes dust the wind scatters it away drives it away then what happens the rock turns into an exceedingly high mountain that fills the whole earth that's the kingdom of God and that's how it's described. I and mean, there's no interpretation here. That's what is actually said by Daniel. He gave the interpretation. You got a problem with that, blame him. And yet, Father said he was right. So we're going with that because he put his in the Bible and didn't put yours in. Nor did he put mine in, so I'm going to go with the one that the Lord vindicated, validated. Are you with me? Does that make sense? Am I, am I stretching you here? Am I out on a limb? Is this confusing? No, it's right there. Read it for yourself. I wanted to do this tonight so you could understand how to go right back to the verse of Scripture. Read it for yourself till you're convinced that what God says is true and that he knows what he's talking about and he doesn't need somebody to interpret what it is he says. Huh? I heard somebody say one time, oh, a person said that anytime you are confused about what Pastor Mark says, come to him and he'll tell you what he means. I don't need anybody, I don't need anybody to go and tell folks what I mean. <laughs> if you want to know what I mean, come talk to me. I got a mouth. Praise God. Have the ability to think and to communicate. Praise God. Huh? The Father don't want anybody telling anyone what he means either. <laughs> oh, if you want to know what God means, come talk to me. Goodness, help us. I'm not. Okay, well, we're moving on. Okay, so I want to back this up so you can, I want to, I want to start right at the beginning here in, um, in verse 38 so that you can understand the fourth beast that I was just talking about. Have I got you confused? I hope I don't because, I mean, you should have this down now, okay? Because not only, you, what did they say? For every hour in class, you should study at least two hours outside of class, right? So sure you, surely you did that already. So you're good to go. So this is all review. Now, <clears throat> having been trained that way. Now, so Daniel's given Nebuchadnezzar. Boy, then this is powerful too. And this happened. This really happened. Nebuchadnezzar has a dream. Says, I'm not going to tell anybody what my dream is because I don't want nobody making up some fictitious interpretation. So if you guys are so insightful and so smart and so connected with, with uh, the power of God, then you tell me what I dreamed and then you tell me what the interpretation is and nobody could do it except for Daniel. He had to have somebody had a real anointing do that. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Nebuchadnezzar was smart. So now Daniel tells him exactly what he dreams and he tells him his interpretation and then they got exalted to the highest place in the kingdom. Those events happened. So thou art the head of gold. So he saw an image at a head of gold and he says to uh, Nebuchadnezzar, you're the first kingdom here, you the head of gold and after you shall rise another kingdom inferior to you and, and, and that was the, uh, the, the uh, arms and the chest of silver. And then after that shall rise another kingdom inferior to that kingdom, a kingdom of brass, and which shall bear rule over the earth. And the fourth kingdom shall be as strong as iron. Okay, there we go, the iron. You with me here? So we got this, we got this 
beast, fourth beast with iron teeth. And, and, and that is one little piece of connectivity with him. But however, understand this. Understand this. Out of that, then, um, comes these feet. After these legs of iron, here comes these feet of iron and clay. Part of iron and part of clay. And then we see that that is the focus of the battle. That is the focus. That is the moment in time when that kingdom rises. That is the moment in time that God destroys the kingdoms of men and sets up his kingdom. And that's the important point to connect. The little horn and the other symbolism and the other, and the other um, symbols ultimately show us a description or key in for us the very moment in time that the Lord is going to come and destroy the kingdoms of men, set up his kingdom, and also then pinpoint for us who the Antichrist is because he's going to show him come out of a nation. And he's just, just going to show him come out of a nation. So go back with me over here to chapter 7. Okay? Because I want to show you the nation he's coming out of. That's my point. Is anybody there yet? This is a great discipline for me. Okay. So now, here we, get, here we get the description of these kingdoms from Daniel, but with a little bit different likeness. He says, he saw four great beasts come up out of the sea, sea of humanity. Was really, was dirt, verse 1 from another says the first was like a lion, had eagle's wings. That's describing the head of gold. In the, in the image that uh, Nebuchadnezzar saw in his dream. That's Babylon. And I beheld till the wings thereof were plucked off, and he lifted it up from the earth and made him stand upon his feet as a man, and a man's heart was given to him. And behold, another beast, second beast like a bear, Media Persia, which is uh, the, the symbolism of silver. And behold, another beast, second like unto a bear, raised up itself on one side and had three ribs in his mouth. And, 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 in the mouth of it, between the teeth of it. And they said thus unto it, Arise, devour much flesh, kingdom of the Medes and the Persians. After this I beheld to lo and another, like a leper, and this being the kingdom of brass, kingdom of Greece, which had upon the back of it four wings of a fowl. The, and the beast had also four heads, and dominion was given to it. Very important point, because out of, uh, what's very what's going to ultimately what we're going to ultimately see here in the next chapter as we read we're going to see uh, King Alexander's empire turn into from one horn representing one king and one kingdom into four horns and out of those four horns is going to come that little horn again the little horn that we've seen there rise up out of that ten horns that came up out of the kingdom that represents the Roman Empire. And so we see then verse 7. And after this I saw in the night vision, behold, the fourth beast. So I want to just I want to stop here before I go into the next chapter to really focus in on what nation the, uh, the Antichrist comes out of. And I want to just look at some connectivity and and in, in understand that not one nation, not one kingdom, rather, can really help everyone see very clearly where the Antichrist emerges from. So God uses two different kingdoms to describe how the Antichrist comes on the scene. So the, the first, time, first way he's going to describe how the Antichrist comes on the scene is he's going to give it, as I said, the 30,000 foot view. And it has a connectivity with the Roman Empire, which is a very difficult thing to understand. But reality of it is, here comes out of this last kingdom, the Roman Empire, these ten horns. And these ten horns, ultimately, by the time you get to the book of Revelation, represent the seventh kingdom. And the seventh kingdom is going to rise. So what God is saying to us is here in the basis if we're trying to describe to you the type of a kingdom, okay? I'm trying to try to describe to you the geographical location and impact of this kingdom. He describes it to us on the basis of the Roman Empire. And he does it two ways. First, he does it with the image 
that uh, Daniel saw of this uh, head of gold, as we just described, all the way down to the feet of, of iron and clay. And we see the Roman Empire, and God ex describes it as two legs, a western and an eastern division. There was two dimensions, two parts to the Roman Empire. An interesting thing about the western division, and that is when the Roman Empire was about to go into obscurity, there was this guy who, uh, whose name was Constantine. And he's like, well, what's the greatest movement going on right now? What's the most popular thing happening? What's really, you know, shaking the world? Well, it's Christianity. Ha, huh, I just had a vision. Are you with me? And he grabbed a hold of Christianity and through that, as it were, gained influence in the world. And the impact that he had there, the dimension of the impact that he had there, I can't go into all the details of it, but let me just tell you, he ultimately did more to pollute the gospel and to ruin the advancement of the kingdom of God as it was described by the Lord Jesus Christ than anybody else. He didn't go to Antioch. If he would have gone to Antioch, here's what would have happened. <laughs> All the apostles and the prophets were camped out in Antioch. That's where, as it were, headquarters were moved from Jerusalem at the, at the Dispora at 70 AD when, it, when Jerusalem was overthrown by the Roman Empire. And then basically the camp or capital of, of, of the church moved to Antioch where we see Paul, where we see Barnabas, early on, ultimately that became the camp of the church. He didn't go there because the, the success, real succession, if it were, the real camp, the real Holy Ghost church is in Antioch. He skips over Antioch and he goes to Alexandria. He goes to where all of the, um, uh, all of the Nicolaitans are, all of the Gnostics are, all of those who are Greek philosophers who take in Hellenism, Greek philosophy, the, the beliefs and doctrines of, of Aristotle, the beliefs and doctrines of Plato and Philo, and they've integrated them with the word. Now, our big challenge today is people go there and they find these manuscripts there, and they're so different from the manuscripts that came out of Antioch, there's a bit of confusion, and that's where you're getting your, your different Bibles. Most of your Bibles, the NIV, the New King James Version, and on and on, they are drawing off of those Alexandrian documents, and we know what was going on in Alexandria. They simply said, you can't understand the Bible by itself. You've gotta have it interpreted through us, the Greek philosopher. We really have the gnosis. We have the knowledge of God. And because we have the gnosis or the knowledge of God, we can explain to you what this really means. And that is absolutely heresy because it's the Holy Ghost. Over Antioch, it's the Holy Ghost telling you what the Word of God means. Over here in Alexandria, it is the, the Greek philosopher telling you what the Word of God means. So what happens is, is, is Constantine basically aligns himself with everybody from that stream who started with Justin Martyr, went to Tatian, Clement of Alexandria, then it went to Alexander and Eusapius, ultimately to Jerome, and he's got Jerome locked down. He says, write me a Bible. And then he says, everybody's got to bow to my version. And then that migrated over into an entity that, we, that became the Roman Catholic Church which took on many Babylonian traditions, many occult traditions. And in, embedded within that is the whore religion, okay? And so that some scholars came along and said, ah, it's Rome, it's the Vatican, that's the Antichrist. No, there, I can understand what you're saying. There's a lot of symbolism there. There's a lot of cult Babylonian uh, uh, things going on in that context but it ain't it it ain't it because the whore that 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 was drunk on the blood of the saints she's existed since nimrod's day she is she is the uh the the uh, uh, idolatrous worship that ultimately god said israel's committing adultery and participating in uh, in all kinds of whoredoms with this whore religion 
That's what you read about when you read through uh, First, Second Samuel, First, Second Kings, First, Second Chronicles, and then you heard now these different prophets that were all to, alive almost at the same time: Isaiah, Jeremiah, right, um, Ezekiel, Hosea. They all right there prophesying. You with me, Micah? So now, so here we got this Roman Empire. From the legs comes the feet, ten toes. Ten toes, of those ten toes are related to the ten horns to some degree. They're related to the ten horns to some degree. What comes out of one of those horns? Or what, those, the ten horns, are those, those ten horns represent ten kings. What comes out of one of those horns? A little horn. It's got, that is the Antichrist represented by his mouth. And ultimately when we get to Revelation chapter 8, uh, forgive me, Daniel chapter 8, we see that he's the one who creates. This little horn is the one who makes the, 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 the temple desolate. He commits the act of abomination that makes the temple desolate. To make the temple desolate is a very interesting concept. Okay? Because from a, that whole Old Testament concept, from that whole Old Testament type, from the whole reality of the Old Testament, the only way that the temple could be in, be become desolate is it has to be inhabited uh oh uh oh uh oh mister i'm staying in the tribulation How, what happens now when god has moved back into the holies of holies in israel you got to put that one in your little pipe and smoke on it for a little while and tell me what the effect is going to be forgive me for being facetious but it's just nonsense this stuff L listen there's no way for the temple the holies of holies to become desolate until it becomes inhabited there you're talking an entirely different uh, me effective uh, means by which God is interacting and communicating with humanity he's not in the holies of holies in a temple in Israel right now are you with me he is in his temple in the heavenlies okay and he's opened it up all, he's opened up his arms real wide to all the nations and the peoples of the earth and says, come on in. But he's going to, he has to go back into, there, he allows that in, in the reinstitution of temple worship, and he has to be integrated and interacting with it. Otherwise, it's already defiled, it's already desolate. You can't say he made it. Jesus said, the Antichrist will commit an abomination that will make the temple desolate. And it's only of one desolate of one thing. Not, not, not the Ark of the Covenant. Not a priest. It can only be desolate of one thing. The presence of God. Now that's a very important point. You've got to grab a hold of that. Okay. And. Um, so. This connectivity. Of these ten kings. Most theologians have said. Oh, what we've got to understand then is we've got to look on a map and we've got to see the influence of the kingdom of, of, of the Roman Empire. Well, the, to do that is a great exercise. If you took the kingdom of Egypt, then you overlay that, which is the first kingdom. When you're looking at the, when you're looking at the, the beast in Revelation chapter 17 with seven heads, Okay, you got to go back to Egypt. That's where it starts. Egypt, Syria, Babylon, Media Persia, Greece, Rome. And then the seventh kingdom that she's actually being seen in existence with at that time, which has not yet come up yet. It's not come up yet. But where does it come up from? Huh? It comes up from the Roman Empire. That ge geograph geographical location. So you got Egypt overlay on top of that is Syria, and it, there's a little bit of outliers. What it would be Ethiopia? I think Ethiopia would be about it. Then lay over top of that um, Babylon. It's kind of the same, pretty much the same scope. Then lay over top of that Media Persia, gets a little bigger, right? Lay over top of that. Greece, whoosh, gets really big, right? Because of what Alexander the Great was a, a Alexander the Great was a more 
vivid type of the Antichrist than um, Nimrod was. And that's why in, in the next chapter, the Antichrist is going to be most closely associated with Alexander the Great, who in seven years conquered the world, expanded a conquest. What was his purpose? What was his philosophy? To bring all the people together under one nation and under one rule. Now, what we read about in, we read about in Revelation, we discover ultimately, John says, there's a beast that's going to rise up out of the, this is Revelation 17, there's a beast that's going to rise up, an angel, an angel of darkness, going to rise up out of the bottomless pit. And he says, he was, and he is not, and he shall ascend up out of the bottomless pit. So he says, he was, he was, be just be, he was before me. He's not existing right now. What was, it, what was existing during the days of John? The Roman Empire. The one that we're talking about that has these, this, that dreadful, ugly-looking beast that, you know, has the tongue sticking out on the, on the little uh, image that we put up with the iron teeth, the ten horns, and out of one of the horns comes a little, a little horn, which is the Antichrist. So he says that he's talking in that context. That's the context he is in. So what we most commonly believe is he was, thus he was existing during the Greek, Grecian Empire. In other words, what did they say? Who did they say? Who did they say Alexander the Great was the son of? Zeus. Who's Zeus? Who's Zeus? Who first propagated the doctrine of Zeus? Nimrod. He made that known. He made Mount Nimrod. Mount Nimrod, which is Mount Nimrod in t southern Turkey, testifies that Nimrod was involved with, with Zeus and with all of these other gods that he created, which were nothing more than fallen angels. He propagated their, who they, their image, their, the, the interaction with them, and set up a means of having idols, teraphim, as it were, unique uh, images, that you could, if you did the right ritual, you could get demons to obey you through the interaction with that idol. And that's a part of the whore religion. And it's ultimately a part of all that he did and propagated within the framework of making known to men sorcery, witchcraft, Every form of interaction with demon spirits and, the, and the, the demonic realm. So, um, this angel, do I believe that Alexander the Great was a son of an angel? No, I'm not saying that. Is there a possibility? Yep, certainly a possibility. Was there other sons of angels? That's why God destroyed the earth. Genesis chapter 6, huh? It is, it is most commonly believed because of certain words associated with Nimrod, of which I also ascribe to, that he was a son of an angel. Pretty, pretty crazy, huh? Or at least a descendant of, of an angel. Huh? And, and, and so, so he said, well, his dad was Cush. Well, understood. But who was Cush? And where did he come from? And how did all of this get, what, what all got propagated through that? We don't really know. We can't say. But there's certain words associated in the Hebrew language with Nimrod that makes us be to believe that he was a son of an angel just like Goliath was. J Goliath was a son of an angel. Um, who had, who had, uh, who, who, who stood out to you in the conquest of Joshua? What giants really stood out to you in the conquest of uh, of Joshua. Ha Og, king of Bashan. Huh? Who was he? Son of an angel. Um, these things really happen. I, 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 I don't know why. Well, listen, I went to, back in the 70s, I went to a exhibit, of, a Sudanese exhibit, and the crowns were that big around. And the, their, their images that they had created of the idols that they worshipped, they looked just like basically the the images of what um, uh, the uh, 
the movie industry made uh, Vulcans to look like. Pointed ears. It's amazing. This is stuff, this is stuff back going back, you know, 4,000 years ago. The rings, the rings were that big around. The rings that they put on their finger. And of course, in the exhibit, they said, well, you know, these were just symbols of their power. They didn't, of course, they couldn't wear this. I mean, I could put the ring on my head and use that for a crown. I mean, somebody's fingers big around in my head. Think about that. These things really did happen. I mean, we know they really happened because the Word of God said they happened. And we didn't just see, we didn't just see one angel. I mean, we didn't just see one giant. We've seen whole families of giants and scattered all throughout various different parts of the earth during the days of, uh, clearly, during the days of Abraham and in the days of Moses and of Joshua and then always all, all the way extending to David. Occult worship, the rise of the occult, the interaction with angels. Did you know that that's really these people who practice witchcraft and practice sorcery, they know they interact, they call them the watchers or the immortals. They're calling, they're angels. They're fallen angels. Huh? They, they consciously are going to tell you they're interacting with angels. They, they refer to them in different terms, but if you break it down, that's what they're going to say. Even in the new age, they're interacting with angels. It's just another form of interacting, you know, with, with in, in a witchcraft realm, in a sorcery realm. And, you know, fathers, when he begins to deal with Babylon, he's dealing with them because of their sorceries. Huh? So, it's very important to, to just kind of look at this landscape. And I know I'm kind of stuck here in this, this dimension. But I, 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 I was just talking about this particular point. I think, it's very, very in, I think it's very important for us to try to broaden the influence, to some degree, of the Roman Empire. Because... You can't escape. There's a connectivity. It's the last kingdom. It, it's the last. It's the last. It's like it's the last kingdom that made the cut. You, are you with me? So wait, wait a minute. How about all these other kingdoms? What's the last kingdom that had that kind of world domination? Why, why is that? Do we become more civilized? Why is it? Is, what, what is what's unique that that gave? The Roman Empire. No, but God decides what's going to go down. We're voting, but the Lord decides. Huh? We're making all of our decisions and cast our ballots, but he's deciding what's going to go on in the earth. You know, Nebuchadnezzar had to come to the reality that God rules in the kingdom of men. I mean, every time I read that, every time I read the book of Daniel, I just hit Daniel chapter 5 and stand up. God brings it. I mean, you know, <laughs> takes a king that he made of great power and turns him into a beast and makes him eat um, grass. Like a beast of the field. Huh. My, 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 my. It's just, it's, it's wonderful to be able to be under his dominion, to be under the rulership of Jesus. He reigns right now. So, you get to go quickly to Daniel chapter 8. I'm going to try my best. You know, it's like I open my mouth and I'm about ready to say about 10 different things. And I got to decide, well, which one am I going to say? And, um, so I'm looking now in, uh, I want to look at verse 19 real quick. Okay, just staying in chapter 7, let me just look at 19. Because I've said some things, I, I believe this would help clear it up a little bit. Then, when I, then I would know the truth of the fourth beast, which was diverse from all the others, exceeding dreadful, whose teeth were of iron and, of, and, and his nails of brass. He's diverse from all the others. He goes beyond all the others. There's something about him that extends beyond the period of time that he represents. And, of course, we know that's true because there's something about him ultimately then that, that ended, let's just say, in the 3rd century A.D., but then is yet still to come here in the, in the, in the not-too-distant future. For, for okay... The one that devoured, break in pieces, stamped the residue with his feet. And of the ten horns that were on his head. And of the others which came up, and, and of the other which came up, and before whom three fell. And we're going to show you. The one, this little horn, he's going to rise up among the ten. Ten kings. Should be ten kings. 
And he's going to rise up among the ten. And he's going to be able to pluck up three kings. He's going to be able to, he's going to, be able to take rule and dominion over three other nations beside himself. And we're going to see exactly who those nations are in the next chapter. Very important. Okay? And we're going to see the context of it. Is America, if you start overlaying the maps, Egypt, Syria, Babylon, Media Persia, Greece, Rome. Can you see America anywhere? He's not rising. America, did, my America, as far as the Bible is concerned, is an island of the sea. And so I said, can you find America in the Bible? Yes, an island of the sea. And that's it. And so when, when people start preaching these things about America and New York and the stock exchange and the United Nations, United Nations, United Nations is much, pretty much like the World Series. Okay, we invented it and we basically do it all ourselves. We just have people show up, put them in a nice hotel and feed them uh, good breakfast, lunch, supper, and make them feel like a royalty and get them all to sit around and talk to one another. Hey, that's our invention. Hey, eh? yeah. it's true. Lord Jesus, help us. <laughs> Don't listen to see some people should not watch CNN. It's too much. Look, you know, my wife cannot watch TV. And I'm going to tell you why. She has a problem breaking it. She has a problem breaking it out from reality. We say to her, all of us say to her, Mom, it's acting. It's not real. She's like, I can't take it. Huh? Look, we need to deal with CNN like we deal with any other movie. Okay? And you deal with it like the new Hercules movie. And you'll be okay. And so before whom and so he's really focused in on the fourth beast. And and this and this little horn. And I beheld and the same horn made war with the saints. Ah, there we go. And the same horn, the little horn. Made war with the saints. Now, he's going to make war with the saints at a, a very specific, identifiable time. Because you can say that about a lot of kings. You can, say that about, you can say that about King Sennacherib, that he made war with the saints when he came up against Israel. Well, loosely, because they were not saints. They were, uh, they were devils. I mean, and you can say that about Nebuchadnezzar when he came up against uh, Judah. Praise God that in the midst of all of that iniquity, there's a Daniel in the midst of the king's seed. Hey, come on. That is beautiful that there's people so devoted to God. It's always been a blessing to me. There's an Isaiah there. There's an Ezekiel there. There's a Jeremiah there. And it goes on. But he's going to get this really pinpointed for us. And he says, And he had a mouth that spake great things, whose look was more stout than his fellows, fierce. I beheld, and the same horn made war with the saints and prevailed against them until the Ancient of Days came. Who's the Ancient of Days? Take a guess. The ancient of days, the Lord Jesus Christ, the eternal God, came and fought against him, prevailed against him. Once again, the rock uh, cut out uh, uh, without hands that, was, that came out of heaven, that was cast out of heaven. You can just see Father winding up. And he's sending Jesus, and he's sending him right to the battle of Armageddon to destroy the Antichrist, the false prophet, and the beast. And to take them all, including the angels that are there, the fallen angels that are there, giving them power and aiding them to do that which they did. Alexander did what he did by an help of an angel from hell. That's how he, that's what he did. That's how he was able to do what he did. When you see people rise to such dominant power, that's why. Did, did Hitler listen to his generals? No. <laughs> Bones. Look at the liver. Where are the stars at? You know what he did? He went and got, he went and got Satan's seat. The seat of Satan. The seat of idolatry, which John called the seat of Satan at Pergamos. And brought it where? To Berlin. He went and got every 
satanic, every cult, every demonic symbol he could get. And he brought it to Berlin. The swastika. That's a Hindu power, a Hindu symbol to interact with Hindu demons. That's where he got it. He got every demonic symbol he could get, every occult symbol of power to interact with the, with the, with the unseen realm that he could get. Guess where all of it's been moved? Dubai. It's literally been moved to Dubai. What did Dubai do? This is by design. This isn't somebody just playing a joke. Ha ha, we're just going to play a joke. And, and just kind of tease the Christians. This is not that at all. They designed every artifact from an, the ancient kingdoms of Nimrod, including Egypt, Assyria, Babylon, Media, Persia, Greece, Rome. They took all of those things and got them in, in Dubai. What's being set up with Dubai right now? It's a part of the trade system of Babylon. Babylon will be a great trade center, just like God said it. So it was going to be a great trade center in, 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 in Revelation chapter 18. And mystery Babylon, which was ultimately started by Nimrod himself and all of his worship and all of his ziggurat and all the things that he was doing, which God said he could enter into the realm of heaven, nothing would be forbidden that he said it's hard to do, is ultimately going to be realized in his full fruition, in his full iniquity and stage of rebellion against God in the not too distant future. Get yourself ready you are living in the days of deception you're living where the church the only power the church has is truth only power the church has is the word of god and the spirit of god and what's going on is satan is lying and deceiving and stealing truth from the hearts of men and leaving people in this in these doctrines of devils in this state of heresy that they now described as the true grace of god and what's happened is the end result they have no ability to stand against satan's next strategic act only one place safety it's truth spirit truth it's in his word it's right in the midst of christ jesus what he's commanding what he's lord over ruler over right in the middle of what the holy ghost is doing hear me I'm not guessing. I'm just declaring these things to you. And, and I want you to get them in, in you so you can teach other people as well. And uh, when things get worse, as they are going to, and if you don't think they're going to get worse, read the Bible again. Huh? When you know where the end point is, all you got to do is do what we call a little bit of what? interpolation right or extrapolation we're interpolating to our point and extrapolating to that point there's no extrapolation out there because it's a it's a peg in the ground so all we have to do is interpolate right and then understand where am i at right now do i understand my seasons do i understand my times do i understand what's going on do i see do I see doctrines of devils? Do I see perilous time? Do I see seducing spirits? Do I see the masses flocking to, itching, uh, to, to, to teachers that are teaching false doctrines, having itching ears? I see it. I see the signs of deception. I see the signs of apostasy that is revealed in the Word of God. And I'm telling you, this is where it's going. You need, I want to let you know. I want you to be aware. I don't want these things just to take you. Um, and, and, and take you blindly. I want you, if you're going to follow it, willfully give yourself over to the heresy. Don't do it because you didn't you know the truth. Huh? And pray, and you're not going to willfully give yourself. So this, it's the ancient days that came. And judgment was given to the saints of the Most High. And the, and the time came that the saints possessed the kingdom. Praise God. Now we know exactly who we are and where we're at. And we see that that fourth kingdom, we know by, in, by clear interpretation of what Daniel was saying, that that is the Roman Empire, that that is the, the, the first and foremost, the, the terrible beast is the, the legs of iron. And that the horns, the ten horns, are perfect, uh, perfectly in agreement with, for the most part, with the ten toes. Okay. So, um, go to the next chapter, chapter 8. And let me just show you a little bit clearly, a little bit more clearly. Well, Antichrist coming from the Roman Empire. The region of the Roman Empire. Ooh, that's pretty vast. So let's focus in a little bit here. 
exactly where is he coming from? And so now Daniel has, in chapter 8, he gives us a little bit clearer focus. You're going to dial this thing in. Take it up another couple of resolutions. Okay? Dial this thing in for us. And he, he describes this time, he describes the media of Persian Empire a little differently. Before he described the media, he described the media of Persian Empire as arms and, and a chest of silver, right? That's the first time, chapter 2. Second time, he described the media of Persian Empire as a bear with ribs in its teeth, okay? Now he's going to describe the media of uh, Persian Empire as ram with two horns, the kingdom of the Medes. And the Persians, two horns, two kings re ruling in the kingdom, as it were, okay? Like two divisions, kind of, sort of, loosely, okay? It's two great peoples joined together. And this ram comes, and uh, uh, this ram comes up against a great he-goat. And the he-goat comes and breaks off the horns, break, kills the kings, destroys the kings. And that's what's going on right here in in, in Daniel chapter 8. I'm just going to read this to you. And the goat waxed very great after he had overcome the, the ram. And when he was strong, the great horn was broken. Now, no other, no kingdom or king destroyed Alexander the Great. He died because it was over. Somebody said a mosquito bite. Malaria. He just died. And what happened was he gave his kingdom over to his generals. And there were more than four generals. But what God's going to do is focus in on four divisions. Four important divisions. Okay? He's going to, he's going to focus in on something that's going to happen later that, that was a part of what took place then. Because you can roughly break it out into regions that now per, that consist uh, mostly of Turkey, but expands a little bit beyond Turkey. That was one of them. And then another region is all of ancient Greece, which is not just Greece, but all of Macedonia. You know, the Czech Republic, all of that along the um, Aegean. That's huge, right? Are you with me? Everybody, can you see that? Or I know I like to put the map up at that moment in time, but see, you kind of see that. So there's two of them. And then the third one was the Assyrian. Really, which we would say Syria, but Syria is, it is more than just modern-day Syria sitting there on the coastline. It extends all the way to Nineveh. What's, what's, what's key about Nineveh? Nimrod. Nineveh is just as much. What, what, what nation is Nineveh in? Huh? Yeah, what nation is he in? Iraq. Huh? Iraq. How is it that in these last days, because this wasn't even on the radar really 100 years ago, 150 years ago, what happened that now everything's all about the Middle East? Why? Why? Anybody know? Oil. 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 But is that really all it's about? No. It's about power. It's always been about power there. It's about God the Father setting everything up to turn it all back around into where we see now the nation, the, the, the world empire back over there. The world influence back over there. New economy. New political system. New sociological sociology. The, the, it, you know what is the funniest thing that any academician could ever think that you could make Iraq a democracy? They have ruled tyrannically all, since they've existed. That's the only way these guys know how to do business. This is the way they work. This is the way they do it. That's the way they roll. You don't have democracy in Egypt or Libya it, or, or Syria. It don't work. It's not their culture and heritage. It ain't not that way. <laughs> We're getting ready to see some radical changes. People, we've had a great holiday. We've had a great time of peace and opportunity to propagate the gospel. 
And we became drunk on our own possessions. We became fixated on just more stuff to satiate an insatiable desire. Huh? It, things are getting ready to change. You better get ready. And especially, you better get ready to meet your maker. Especially. I'm ready to go right now. I'm ready. We ready. See, we can say we ready. We ready because we ready. We're kept by the power of God ready. I'm kept by, I can say I'm kept, I don't have to worry. I don't have to doubt. I'm kept by the power of God. I'm ready to be revealed. Amen. I want you to be able to say that, every one of you. So, and out of one of them came forth a little horn. There it is. Out of one of those four came a little horn. Now we've got to lock down a little bit closer, okay? Because the Lord didn't leave it in the whole general di dis dimension of the conquest of Alexander the Great. He broke it up into Greece, Turkey, Syria, and Egypt. And roughly, that gives you a good view of it. And one of the little horns, the little horn ultimately one horn that the little horn comes up out of which is the antichrist kingdom conquers the other three plucks up the other three remember and so and it waxed great even to the host of heaven uh-oh it waxed great even in the host of heaven so he's not just earthly is he so he waxed great even in the host of heaven in other words he's ruling angels He has power in heaven. He has authority in the heavenlies. Not, not as we think of in the terms, in terms of the heavenly realm in which God dwells in. But that term, that unseen realm. See, heavenly can be referring to the unseen realm. It's the unseen realm where fallen angels are. And he waxed great unto the host of heaven and cast down some of the hosts. Whoa. He conquers, overthrows even some of the host of heaven. Figure that one out. And, and he's not done, and of stars. Now we know that host represents what? Armies. And stars represent what? Angels. Over and again. These are, these are not guest typologies. These are very clear typologies. God gives them, calls an angel a star, a star an angel. Okay? And we just want to try to put it into twinkle, twinkle. But it, it isn't, that isn't, the, that isn't the biblical terminology that we want to focus on. I mean, that, the biblical terminology is different from what we would focus on when we're trying to con conceptualize stars. So, and what did he do with them? Cast them down to the ground, stomped on them. In other words, he took total dominion over them. He had dominion over angels and had dominion over host armies that angels command. Pretty radical, eh? See, Satan comes down out of heaven, out of the unseen realm. He's cast out of heaven, out of the unseen realm. When? When? Right at the same, about the same time of the abomination uh, that makes the temple desolate. Verse chapter 13, chapter 12, chapter 13. You see that? He's cast down out of heaven. What does he do? He comes down to earth having what? Great wrath. What? What is he going to do? Make war against the saints. Right now, we try to understand it in view of him being behind the scenes. I'm telling you right now, he's on the front line. Now, you talk about a Luciferian cult having come to its full magnitude of expression and power. Now, he has power to overcome the saints. See, we think of saints and we think of God's holy people redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ in the church right now. But saints are also God's covenant people that are walking with him in his covenant. And so, thus, saints are defined... Daniel was a saint. Israel, was, Mary was a saint. <laughs> you know, they, all of God's covenant people are called holy ones. They're sanctified. They're given the gift of holiness. To be sanctified is to be made a saint. You're sanctified. I'm giving you the gift of holiness. You're my people. I brought you into my covenant. That's who Israel was considered to be since the days of Abraham. Do you understand? And we just try to make it one type. It's not one type. And then we say, well, you know, this is an everlasting covenant. Yeah, it is. But the Lord's going to deal with Israel, his people in a special way that maybe doesn't fit into your model of thinking, but it works perfectly with God's plan. It works perfectly according to what he's decided to do. Are you understanding what I'm saying? Okay. 
Pretty radical stuff, isn't it? And he magnifies himself. Listen to this. Yea, he magnifies himself even to the prince of the host. And by him, the daily sacrifice was taken away in the place of the sanctuary. That's, a, that's the abomination that makes desolate. That's one Jesus said, he that hath wisdom, let him understand. And as and 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 host was given unto him against the daily sacrifice by reason of transgression, and it, and and it cast down the truth to the ground, and practiced and prospered. Then I heard one saint speaking to another, saying, "How unto that certain saint which spake, how long shall be the vision concerning the daily sacrifice and the transgression of desolation, to give both the sanctuary and to the ho and, and the host to be trodden underfoot?" And he said unto me, unto 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. Now, unto two, uh, forgive me, unto, unto 2,300 days. Okay. The Lord not only gives to us the years, he gives to us the months, and he gives to us the days. And he sets it forth in a chronological description that no one can mistake. So I just want to encourage you, go over these passages of Scripture and, and, and let them become a part of just your natural processes of thinking so that you just know them that well. Because if you, if you do that, there's more here that God would make known to you. But what, we're, what, we're, what I'm pur pur purposely trying to do is just keep it really very, very simple. Just... Keep it very, very basic so that every one of us can have our eyes open concerning what's going on right now. We need to understand what's going on in the future so we can understand a little bit more about what's going on right now. And I know it's getting late, but I'm going to just try real quickly. I'm going give to my, give my best effort here to try to run through Revelation 19 to 20 real quick. And uh, the reason I want to do this, I'm, just gonna, I'm not going to go over it all. I just wanted to hit Revelation 19 and 20. Just, just, just refer to it. Because I want to help you see something here that might be a little bit confusing to you. In some respects, Revelation chapter 19 is a parenthetical, well, is it a par you could call it a parenthet parenthetical statement. Okay? Because... Um, Paul, Paul, John's going to say, after I saw these things, I heard a great voice of much people in heaven saying, Hallelujah, salvation, glory, and honor, and power unto the, our Lord God, for true and righteous are his judgment. For he hath judged the great whore uh, which did corrupt the earth with her fornication. And he judges the great whore in the first three and a half years. And I don't have time to explain that to you, but it's important for you to just grab a hold of this. And there, there's more to say about the ten horns. I can't tell you right now. Because we don't have enough time. But you need to understand what I've already told you, the foundation, but then I'll tell you more later. Uh, which did corrupt the earth with their fornication. How long she corrupt the earth? Somebody said, oh, ISIS, they're headhunters. See, it's ISIS. They're the Antichrist. They take heads. The Assyrians took heads. The Assyrians are headhunters. You see any release of Syrians? What are they doing? Carrying heads. Okay. So this is what we're talking about here. When did, when did Mohammedism begin? The 7th century A.D. It's not even on the radar. Are you with me? It's like America. It's not even on the radar. Are you with me? It had nothing to do with Egypt. had nothing to do with Assyria. had nothing to do with, media, uh, with Babylon, Media, Persia, Greece, Rome. had nothing to do with it. It's just ridiculous. No, it's the rise of the new doctrine. If you haven't already heard it. ISIS is it. It's the Mohammedist religion. They're the guys. They're the Antichrist. That's where the Antichrist is coming from. I do admit that the 13th Imam looks like the Antichrist. They have got a concept of the 13th Antichrist. And he does come out of the Middle East because he comes out of Assyria. Because it's, I didn't go into the proofs of it, but it's actually when you've got Assyria, Egypt, Turkey, and Greece, we know that in Daniel's prophecies that that the little horn conquers Assyria, I mean, conquers Greece, Turkey, and Egypt. So at least one, when you take out three, you got four. Okay. 
<clears throat> the process of elimination is already completed. He plucked up three in the midst of the Grecian, in the midst of the context of the Grecian Empire. It's Assyria. He's the Assyrian. You're, you're, we're probably getting really warm when you say Babylon. When you get re- you're getting really warm when you say Iraq. But Assyria is a kingdom that could be could go from from the modern day Syria, and then of course that's where people now have a little bit more evidence. Aha! ISIS came out of Syria. Well, you're warm. Well, praise God. Now we're not in Russia no more. <laughs> we're down. We're down closer. We're get warm. But now we're pinning. We're pinning the tail on the wrong side of the donkey. Okay. <clears throat> Trying to move on. And so here's what's going on. The Lord has judged the great whore. Um, he's avenged the blood of his servants, which date back um, to the days of when children of Israel in Egypt. Amen? Okay, it's true. That's what it is. Not just, not just one period of time because she's riding on the beast with seven heads. She's been there since Egypt. You with me? Do you see that? She's riding on a beast. She's always been there. She was on the beast when the beast only had one head. She was on the beast when the beast had two heads. You just didn't get to see it then. Then she was on the beast riding the beast when the beast had three heads. Then she's still riding the beast when the beast gets four heads. Now it's the beast got five heads. Now the beast got six heads. Where are we at with the beast with six heads? Roman Empire. Now she's still riding the beast on the, on, on the seventh head when the beast gets the seventh head. And the seventh head is where the ten horns come up out of. And the seventh head is where the Antichrist first emerges into power. But what he's going to do is he's going to have, there's an eighth one. There's an eighth kingdom. There's an eighth kingdom. The eighth is going to rise, and this is going to be unique because now this is the beast, the eighth beast kingdom. This is the kingdom, literally, where it's like Satan's ruling on earth. Hectic. And his occult and his practice of everybody bowing down and worship him. So it's like Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar makes a great image, right? After he, right? Tells everybody to worship the image. What happens? Three Hebrew children get, turned, get thrown in a fiery furnace because they're not going to worship. So what happens? Antichrist. So that's where Nebuchadnezzar is a type of the Antichrist. And so Antichrist image is far better than Nebuchadnezzar's image because he gives it power to speak and talk and makes it live. Wow. That's some serious witchcraft. That's some serious supernatural power. Watch out for lying signs and wonders. Watch out for lying signs and wonders. There's a guy over in the Philippines right now his doctrine, he goes right down the line, preaching. You're like, give me a break. That is amazing, man. New man, transformation by the power of God, just Jesus, Son of God, born of a Virgin Mary. Everything's right. But then at the end, he says, I am Jesus Christ. Worship me. Oh, yeah, he's got churches growing all over the world. There are churches right here. He has churches right here in San Diego. Yeah, watch it. There will continue to be a rise. There will be many who come and say, I am the Christ. Believe him not. And more so as we see the day approaching. You know what the Lord says? That these things that you see that are going to come upon the, on the earth, Jesus said that there will, be, there, there will be pestilence and famine and earthquakes in diverse, diverse places. And he says, and it will be like a woman in birth pains. And the closer you get to the end, the closer you get to the delivery, the closer you get to that point where all this thing breaks loose, guess what happens? The frequency comes. Earthquakes are coming closer and closer. I started watching, monitoring the earth when they came out with that app. The the, um, um, disaster report. Because I just, I like monitoring it. I like watching, and I've started watching quake feeds and, 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 and studying quake feeds as soon as it first came out and been studying today. You watch it. 
If you did a graph of it, you could see it's continually getting closer together and higher in magnitude. Watch out, man. This thing's getting ready to hit. I remember just watching Quake feeds, and it was like, you know, one, twos, you know, maybe once in a while, three, and then the sequence of it. Now it's just close together, fives, fours, fives, sixes. And now those are commas. Those used to be really like ones and twos and threes. Watch out. If you, you know what? <laughs> I, know how, I know how to do, I know, I know how to basically interpret scatter plots. Guess what's going on? Guess, what, guess what's happening? It's going to go to seven, eights, and nines all over the place. And there's going to be a whole lot of shaking going on. Huh? I've seen more um, volcanoes over the past year than has ever shown up on the radar. Look, people, I just want you to get ready. I just want you to start walking with God and start living right. Because I'm telling you, everywhere you look, the earth is declaring that this is the end. Everywhere you look from a spiritual dimension, it's declaring this is the end. It's time to sober up. The Word of God's to sober up. So I'm going to get some better thoughts here. And, it came to, and, and a voice came out of the throne saying, Praise our God, all ye his servants, and ye that fear him, both small and great. And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude, that's us, and as the voice of many waters, and the voice of mighty thundering, saying, Hallelujah, that's us. For the Lord God omnipotent reign, I'm right in the big middle of that. Let, let, it, let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him, for the marriage of the Lamb has come. That's what I'm doing. And his wife has made herself ready. Now, this is happening before the, this is happening before the Armageddon. The marriage supper of the Lamb is happening before the Armageddon. Now, watch this. Watch this. Just because it's in chapter 19 don't mean it's after. 19 breaks out for us what took place in chapter 16. We saw in chapter 16 what's going on from an earthly perspective. Now, we're going to see in chapter 19 what's going on from a heavenly perspective with respect to the battle of Armageddon. Where the rock that is cut out without hands and cast of the earth and strikes those ten toes and, and ultimately brings an end to the kingdoms of men. There will be no more kingdom of men at this point in time. It's over. God's kingdom, thousand year reign of Jesus Christ, he subdues everything, destroys the last enemy death, eradicates sin. Satan never gives another chance and get ready to create a new heaven and a new, a new, heaven, a new earth wherein dwells only righteousness, which is, I'm going to wait till the next time. I told you I wanted to talk about that one this time. But I'm having to wait the next time because I just felt so. I, I wanted to do. Tw I wanted to do the new heaven, and new earth tonight. And when I was just considering it, you know, I just felt, you know, I I've just got to know that I accomplished the goal here to help people understand where we're at right now and where it's going to go and where your eyes should be looking if you want to understand how this whole thing is going to begin to develop and and how it's going to come together. And so I hope I've accomplished that with all my stuttering. But right blessed are they that are called in the marriage supper of the Lamb. That's me. And he said unto me, these are the true sayings of God. And I fell at his feet and worshipped him. And he said unto me, see that, that you do not. I'm one of your fellow servants. I'm one of your brethren. Not even an angel. I have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God. For the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. I wonder who it was that was talking to John. But, you know, I'll have to wait and find out later. And I saw heaven open, behold, a white horse. Now, Jesus is getting ready to go down and fight the battle of Armageddon. It's after the marriage supper of the Lamb. I'm telling you right now, if you're going through the tribulation, you missed out. You should have been here. It was a good meal, and it's all done. We're finished. <laughs> marriage is over. Sorry you couldn't be there. Sorry you weren't here for the wedding. You're not married. You missed. <laughs> yeah, okay, okay. Well, I'm not going to spend too much time with sarcasm here tonight, though I feel like it. Because people always ask me for proofs. I gave you a list. I gave you ten times more proof that we're not going through the tribulation than you gave to me that we are, and you still aren't satisfied. So now it's just oh, nothing to do but to be sarcastic. There's nothing left. I went over here. The point's to get it again. No, I shouldn't be sarcastic either, uh, but I should be something. I should rebuke. But that would come off worse. <laughs> and I'm not going to go into that. I feel an urge to go in exactly what I mean by rebuke and break that down. But I'm not going to do it. Although I feel. <laughs> I'm having to hold on to myself where I feel. 
I feel it. An unction. I feel it even to be a divine unction. <laughs> don't mess with the word. Don't mess with the word. Just don't mess with the word. Just admit when you know in over your head. And don't mess with the word. If you got to take something out of the Bible to explain your point of view, just be quiet. If you got to add something to the word of God to solidify your point of view, just be quiet. Don't do that. Save your soul. There are a whole lot of problems. So, my computer has gone bye-bye on me. And I want to finish reading this. Where was I? Oh, yeah. And, it, and I, who? Hallelujah. He's on a white horse. The Lord knows how to, how to, how to travel. And, 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 he set, and he that sat upon him was called faithful and true. That's Jesus. Righteous and, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. Praise God. His eyes are a flame of fire. The people said that Jesus is done with his wrath. He's not done. He's not done. Here, look at here. Done with his wrath. Father's done with his wrath. He, he fulfilled and completed and finished all of his wrath and when he crucified Jesus. Well, I'm telling you right now, Jesus is just getting warmed up right here. Verse 12. And his eyes were a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns, and his name is written. And, it, and, and he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he, was, and he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. That's Jesus. And, his, and the armies, that's us which were in heaven, followed him in heaven after having had the marriage supper of the Lamb. Amen. Before the battle of Armageddon. I just want to make sure everybody knows where we're at because somebody continues to lose track quickly. It's like the person who's losing their mind. About every two minutes, you must re-explain to them <laughs> everything that you just got finished saying for the past, you know, however long, five minutes. They, they, see, you tell them something. Okay, and we're all settled, got that. Yeah. And then two minutes later, like, what did you say? I don't want anybody to lose their place. <laughs> Are you with me? Yes. I hope this is proof enough for you. Yes. My goodness. <laughs> what does it take? Is it, does the Bible say anywhere there's catching away? So many places. And right here, it's just a, one gigantic story about the catching away by application. Amen. See, condolo bosa teraneaki. Said no more. I had somebody say, well, don't you think we're just going to all get caught away and, uh, and just kind of meet the horses in the air We meet Jesus in the air? And just go, Look, man, where are you at? Have you ever read Revelation chapter 19? I mean, please. I want everybody to get this because I'm telling you, this, these are preacher, preachers who preached for more than 30 years. Ask me those kind of questions. And I'm like, if the preachers, if the, the, the preachers are asking me this kind of question, what are people thinking that are sitting in the meeting? If the folks who've been studying the Bible and preaching the Bible for 30 years are asking me these kind of questions, hello, what chapters do you read <laughs> in the Bible? Okay, I've got to get off of this. I'm telling you, I, tell, I, I, I was feeling the unction, but I'm trying to move forward. There's people that are watching this that need this. Email me. I'm happy to respond. Praise God for three, 333,000 hours of viewing time, 25,000 people. Uh, what, 157 nations, something like that? Huh? So, I mean, it's just it's great. It, it, it's it's 25,000 views. Yeah. So it's just, it, it just, it's, it's, it's just great that we can get together, pull all of our resources, and touch that many folks. And I'm just believing God for it to be Twice as many. It can't be twice as many on the nations because there isn't that many nations. But <laughs> certainly can go way up in terms of total viewing. And Amen. And he was clothed with vesture. I said that one. And out of his mouth, verse 15, goes a sharp sword. And with it he 
should smite the nations, and he shall rule with a rod of iron, praise God, and he treads the winepress of the fierce wrath of the Almighty God. Amen. And he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. Amen. Hallelujah. And I saw an angel standing in the sun, cried with a loud voice, saying to all the fowls that fly in the midst of the heaven, Come, we got a supper for you. Then that ye may eat the flesh of kings and the flesh of captains and the flesh of mighty men and the flesh of horses and them that set on them and the flesh of men, both free and bond, both small and great. And I saw the beasts and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him and that set on the horse and against his army. And I'm going to tell you right now, Satan's right in the big middle of that. He's the one who's leading it. And the beast was taken and him and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast and them that worshipped his image. These both were cast alive into the lake of fire, kind of like, kind of like, uh, uh, kind of like Korah and Dathan. Uh, uh, burning with, uh, uh, they were both cast uh, alive into the lake of fire, burning with brimstone. Somebody said, Do, is there any scriptures that says that, the, that hell has got fire? Yeah, uh, many. There's one of them. And... The, <laughs> Uh, Jesus, <clears throat> and the rim, you know, somebody said, well, you know, is this say this, say that? I said, like, read the Bible. Oh, well, that's all you Christians say. Read the Bible. <laughs> <laughs> what else are we supposed to say? That's where we get our information. It's amazing. You should try interacting with all these various different questions that we get from some time. It's, it's, it's entertaining. And so, um, here we are, verse chapter 20. And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit and the great chain in his hand. So, um, let me see. What else did I want to highlight? That's a good one to highlight. And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit, and the great chain was in his hand, and he laid hold on... Uh, the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil, Satan bound him a thousand years. And so this is, this is where we, of course, understand that there's a thousand years of millennial reign of Christ, 1,000 years. Because Satan's bound, Christ Jesus reigns, we're reigning with him. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take up the rest of it in the last Revelation study um, because it just kind of sets up Sets us up for the total eradication of sin and the total eradication of the power of sin so that God can bring forth a new heaven and a new earth. God, when God brings something, when God brings something new forth in himself, he eradicates sin. He removes it. Takes it totally away. Like as he has brought us forth into the new birth. Hallelujah. Has brought it out of, brought us out of darkness into the, His marvelous light. How He made all things new, and now all things are God. Now that we can be taught of God, living in the living in living in the kingdom of God. Somebody said, "You live in the kingdom. I'm living in the kingdom of God." Well, it looks like to me you live in the kingdom of men. Well, you're looking at it wrong. I got the king living on side of me. He never goes anywhere without his kingdom. I'm right in the big middle of his kingdom. In fact, I'm. In, in fact, I'm actually seated with him in the heavenly realm, walking in the Holy Ghost. In fact, the Holy Ghost is here too, and Father came along as well. I mean, you talk about total rule. Come on, see, Jesus got to rule for a thousand, reign for a thousand years until He subdues everything, so that then Father can come down and be all in all. Father's already here, over here, right here, right now. That's what the faith teaches us. Amen. We want you to get in the faith and just get excited about it. And quit believing a lie. Believe a lie, you'll be damned. You believe the truth, and you'll be set free. Amen. Okay, you can leave this on. I'm going to leave it on because there were some good questions last time, and uh, I thought it would have been good to have left it on. Yeah, question? Yeah. Well, it's a little bit more to go into than now than than I want to, but you could just take it take to take it go ahead and just add to it Obadiah. And Obadiah has 
a Messiah on every, a Messiah, a, a Savior on every hill in Zion and every hill in the Pleasant Land. So, um, you know, we're going to, the beautiful thing of it is that is talking about the Assyrian, the Antichrist, that is talking about that, no question about it. Um, but reality of it is, um, you know, we're going to, as the saints of the Lord Jesus Christ, we're ruling with him for a thousand years. And, and of course, Obadiah is pretty much about the millennial reign. That's, you could say, is, is before the millennial reign. And, and that it has a, to some degree, it appears to have an interface with the Antichrist, but it's not necessarily, not necessarily an interface with the Antichrist. It's what would take his place. Um, what we do know is this. We do know that as far as Satan and the Antichrist and his kingdom, in terms of as it's functioning in the seven years of tribulation, specifically the last three and a half years, that he has power against over all the saints, that Israel as a nation is flees before him. God rescues Israel as a nation himself by, um, you know, the description that you have, for example, in Revelation chapter 12, where the Antichrist comes at that in the middle of the of the of the three and a half uh, seven years rather after three and a half years of the tribulation going on he comes in he makes uh, the abomination that makes desolate and at that time he would have killed and destroyed and overthrown and eradicated Israel um, and what happens of course is he hears a rumor concerning the kingdoms of the north and he turns to go and subdue them. And who are the kingdoms of the north? Well, you know, that could be, that could be the, you could say geogra geographically, it could be Russia, and it could be, include China and, and, and India. There's just a vast expanse there. We know that uh, those armies are, he's going to basically bring up all the armies of the earth against Israel. At the end of the seven and a half, at the end of the seven year tribulation, at that moment in time that we're reading about there in the battle of Armageddon, either in Revelation chapter 16 or Revelation chapter 19. And um, the only, it, it's amazing to think that, that he's going to go get all of the nations of the earth. They're going to ultimately eradicate Israel. And while they're doing it, they're going to fight against God. Now, there, he's deceiving the whole earth. And someone says, well, is it a speculation that men have the knowledge that they're actually fighting against God? I don't believe that it is, and I could lay out the proofs for that. I just don't have time to do that tonight. But when you talk about the principal men that are referred to in Micah, we don't know anything about that. We know that, Eli we know that the two witnesses, which we believe, are Enoch and Elijah. We believe that they're Enoch and Elijah because Enoch and Elijah have never died. They've been alive in the presence of the Lord. Enoch for about 5,000 years. Elijah for about 2,700 years. Alive in the presence of the Lord. And that literally they have such supernatural power that for three, really for three and a half years, the last three and a half years, they defend Israel. Those are the two principal men <laughs> that God has revealed to us that stave off the enemies of Israel until the Lord Jesus comes. And then at the end, just before the Armageddon, then there's, they, 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 there's power given to the Antichrist dominion to destroy e those two witnesses. Their bodies lay dead three days and three nights in the streets. Then they resurrect. And right there, basically, con that converges with the end. So we don't know. It's not revealed. We know too. Then, of course, we know that there's a whole bunch coming up against the Antichrist right at the end. Jesus leading them. Any other questions? 
Yes. He's not making a visit. He's right where he is. No, no, he's sitting on it. I don't, I think, well, I know what you're driving at. And, and, and what you're driving at is that heaven isn't as close as, as that would make it or the dimension in which God dwells in, the place that we call his throne room, the great crystal sea where all the saints are gathered around, isn't really that close. And that it would be somewhere like way out in the distance somewhere, some planet somewhere. Which one would you choose? Um, I don't believe that that's the case. And I'm going to tell you why I don't believe that's the case. I believe that it's right, the, the dimensions of what Father is doing, what he has, and, and, and what heaven is described to be is just right here. Um, because when... Jacob, and Jacob's the first one to get the revelation. And when the Lord re revealed himself to Jacob, he said, after that vision and after that encounter of seeing angels ascending, uh, descending from the throne of God, he said, I'm, I'm in the house of the Lord and I didn't know it. That's a great revelation. You have to step over top of that rev revelation to make heaven quote unquote by the on the by by defined as we're defined as we're discussing right now somewhere far far away and what purpose would it be far far away and why can't why what's wrong with father having done it all right here i know you say well it's so vast yeah it's so vast and i know you can say well the heavens can't contain him that's that's true but he still has a body and he still sits on a throne and he still has a place no, the heavens can't contain him because he can reach out and he's not, but he's not existential either. And you don't have to get some kind of mind warp about space and time either. You don't have to start folding space. You don't have to have string theories and, you know, all the rest of the wild imagination where men are trying to describe, you know, to comprehend such a vast expanse of space. Because I would, I believe, personally believe that the universe is as, as expansive and as infinite as he is in time and person. But that doesn't make him existential. Existential, an existential concept of God doesn't belong to the framework of biblical thinking. It belong, belongs to the framework of Hellenistic thinking with an emphasis on the H-E-double-L. I think, it, I think it was a great play on words in the English language that we should speak of Greek philosophy and, and the Greek culture as Hellenistic. <laughs> and that, is, that, that ultimately became Jewish philosophy, <clears throat> Jewish philosophy, Midrash philosophy, Talmudic philosophy, <clears throat> but it's not biblical philosophy. And it is amazing to me how many people try to inter try to say that Talmudic midrash, or well, huh, I would say that Talmudic philosophy, midrash philosophy, is more Philo philosophy. And Philo, albeit he was a Jew, was a student of Plato. So it's Platoism, and it was, it's Aristotleism, and with a dash of Socrates. And so you 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 know you, it just doesn't belong to a biblical framework of thinking does that make sense so <clears throat> nothing can escape his attention he's omnipotent he's all-powerful but the idea that he's omnipresent well if you're where does it say that in the bible i know if i go down in the hill and i'm in my bed in hell you would be there that's fine and there's no place wherever I went, if I went into the, you know, into the universe, you would be there. But that doesn't make him existential. 
it makes him there. It makes him conscious there. His presence felt there. He said, I, I came down into Sodom and Gomorrah to see if it is all together according to the reports that I have received. He's constantly having angels coming and saying, we've been throughout the, we've been up and down the, throughout the, the earth. And we're here to tell you what it's like. We're here to tell you what's going on. So I know I went into a long explanation, but I really wanted to try to just kind of kick existentialism out of the way for just a minute. I wanted to try to kick or, or, or for at, or at least begin to eliminate a need for God to have chosen some other planet in the far, far galaxy. What, does he need to get away from us? No. I'm telling you right now, Elijah's eyes, Elisha's servant's eyes were opened up and he saw heaven right here. He saw the, and then they weren't just visiting. Are you with me? He saw the angel of the Lord, the chariot of the Lord, and the horsemen thereof. He, they weren't just visiting. Does that make sense? So, I'd say that he's about cloud level, right where Jesus disappeared. And now we need to. Have our eyes open. <laughs> Parallel universe. Somebody's getting close. Any other questions? Come on, you can think of something. Now, if you wanted me to bring more proofs as to how I know that the Antichrist comes out of the Assyrian, Assyrian branch of the four horns, but we'd have to spend a whole lot more time on that. So, anybody going to ask any questions? Like, how long is it going to be before he's coming? <laughs> Why are Gog and Magog called the four corners of the earth? And it's a great one. Because Magog represents the uttermost parts of the earth. Magog represents all of the nations of the earth. All of the people, literally, more individually, more specifically, because I didn't actually read that verse in Revelation chapter 20, verse 8. It more specifically represents all of the people who are in allegiance with Gog. That's what it represents. And that's good, because it says verse 15, or is that 19? Or I, think it's Ezekiel, I think it's Ezekiel 38, 15 that you're referring to. Huh? Oh, yeah. Which could corollary to Ezekiel thirty-eight fifteen, Revelation? Yes, Revelation twenty verse eight. Yeah. Right. You got to lead them along one step at a time. Say, I know where the Antichrist comes for, from for sure. How do you know? This is step number one. Well, how do you know that? You take them step number two. How do you know that? Take them step number three. Okay? I would do it. Well, I. I I would really. This is why I wanted. This is why I went ahead and did this tonight from the scripture. I did it from charts last time, but I did it from scripture tonight because I want you to be able to do that. And so, what I would do is I would say, "Oh, I know where the Antichrist comes from because Daniel told us." He did. Yeah. Turn in your Bible to Daniel chapter eight, and then that is just profound right there. And then. You can begin to take them from that point and say, look, let me just show you this. Everywhere this little horn shows up, let me show you what's going on with that. Then you take them to chapter 7, let them see that 30,000 foot view in his connection to the Roman Empire, showing that the fourth kingdom being the Roman Empire is connected to the seventh kingdom. I want you to grab that. Fourth kingdom connected to the seventh kingdom. How's the fourth kingdom connected to the seventh kingdom? The fourth kingdom is connected to the seventh kingdom with the ten horns. 
So there's going to be ten kings arise. What does that mean? That means that things are going to be seriously different in the not too distant future. Huh? Where do you, can you tell me where you can find a king at right now besides the Congo? Are you listening to me? We're talking kings here. We're not talking about prime ministers and presidents. We're talking about sovereign monarchs. That is some pretty radical. I want, I want everybody to get ready for what's happening. I want you to get ready for one time. I don't want you to be shocked. I want the day to take you as, as a thief in the night. Are you with me? Walk them through like that. And yet, yeah, pegs in the ground. Don't start with the image that, that Nebuchadnezzar dreamed of. Work back to it. Eight, seven, two. Then jump to um, Revelation 17. And I, I want to make you skilled. I, you know, I think that's a great question. It's a great point. You're going to have to practice that. You're going to have to get skilled at it. So that you can help bring people along. Now the catching away. Should I do a, I should probably do one, one night on the catching away. So that means I've got to do two more nights. Which is not a, a got to, but I will do. I need to. Two more Friday nights. Because the catching away has very systema a very systematic approach to help people understand the catching away. If I wanted to begin to help people understand the catching away, then the first thing I would do is I'd start with them in Revelation chapter 19. And I'd spend a little bit more time there saying, look, we're talking about Revelation chapter 16 is the battle of Armageddon from the earthly perspective. Revelation chapter 19 is the battle of Armageddon from a heavenly perspective. And so what we're seeing in the sequence of the events there, Revelation chapter 19, marriage supper of the Lamb takes place. We can all understand the marriage supper of the Lamb. And then ultimately, we then re live, leave from the marriage supper of the Lamb, mount up on horses, and ride down with the Lord Jesus Christ to do some serious eliminating of a, uh, of, of a uh, not so much of a threat against God, but a big threat against humanity. And then, where would we go? I would immediately go to Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. And then when I would, where, where would I go? I would go then 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 53. I would start laying out for people to say, looky here. Here is what's going to happen. I would say, the dead in Christ will rise first. And then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up to meet him in the air. When is that going to happen? We... we, we this corruption put on corruption would change in a moment a twinkling of an eye at the last trump when is that we pick, pick up a spot in the book of revelation and then you know if they were coming at me hostile if they're not hostile then i would just simply say here's what this means and and i, and I would then take them from that saying look these are events that are going to clearly happen this is part of the first resurrection let's deal with the first resurrection blessed and holy is he that are, is, is called to the marriage supper of the Lamb who, has, who partakes of the first resurrection. I would just simply then take them from there and I go to Revelation chapter 1, verse uh, 18. And I would say, here's what John wrote. He wrote, he said, Jesus told John to write, the things which are, the things, the things rather which you, which you see, the things which are, and things which shall be hereafter. And so I would then say, looky here. He, he wrote the things that he saw. This is chapter 1, this is Jesus things which are the church revelation chapter 2 revelation chapter 3 and then the things which shall be here after the church or you could say the things which shall be here after the things which shall be here after that which existed or, or that which exists see how would you say it it's better there's a better way to say it the things really it's write the things which are and defining are as the church because the things which are, are the address to uh, Revelation chapter 2, Revelation chapter 3, which is the church. So write the things which you see, Revelation chapter 1, write, write the things which are, define are, here's the, the are. The are is the church, Revelation 2 and Revelation 3. And so then it's, the, then it's simply this, write the things which are at, here after the church. Starts at chapter 4. Now these are the things which shall be hereafter. Now, once I was done with that, I would go into then, if they're still interested, 
And they're still saying, well, what about this? What about that? I would then grab a hold of Daniel 70 weeks. I would, I would we'd back, we'd go on back over to Daniel chapter 8. Daniel chapter 9. And we would start laying out the issue of God's dealings with Israel as a nation. And that there, there is still a 70th week that God has got to deal. There's still a 70 week. There's just the last one still missing. And it looks similar to the first 69. And it's, it has the same, the same subject matter of the first 69. Because it's about God's dealing with the people of Israel. And his covenant with the people of Israel. And the 70th one is not yet happened. And that's why we know that the tribulation is about God's dealing with the people of Israel. But it's also about his wrath poured out upon all sin and iniquity. Okay. And then I'll show them the three companies of saints. In Revelation chapter 6 and 7. And I ask them which company they are in. Because there's only three companies of saints. Seen in the book of Revelation. There's only three companies. There's those who are beheaded. And they under the altar. They stuck. They not appearing anywhere except for under the altar. They're crying out, avenge our blood. Huh? Then there's the 144,000. What tribe are you from? And then if, a, if it's a girl, say you don't even count because these are virtuous men who have not known women, or known women, right? So they don't count. I'm sorry. I mean, it's not that you don't count. You just don't count there. <laughs> woman, a, a woman cannot be a virtuous man who's not known a woman. <laughs> and then there's the great, there is the great innumerable company of saints. With the, with, the, with the palm branches, which represents victory, having come out of great tribulation. And, this, and that is the great tribulation of that which every saint has gone through since the days of Abel. And I've gone way over. I've got you two hours in tonight. Okay. Amen? Love all of you. I know why you weren't asking questions now. No, I'm just kidding.